welcome children, young and old. Continue to listen if you truly feel bold to a show discussing your favorite frights, entertainment that tends to go bump in the night. Hosted by the spectacular Dave, a man you'll wish they would put in a grave. So lie in your coffins and seal your fate. It's time, boys and girls, for Recapitate! <laughs> Welcome back to Recapitate. My name is Dave Catville, and welcome back to the only show where it's good to hear evil. Today with me, I have a very talented artist who's going to talk with me about one of my personal favorite movies. Say hello, everybody, to Nikki Nax. How's it going? Hello. Today we're going to talk about Tremors. That's right. The uh, the infamous Kevin Bacon film. Oh, Kevin Bacon. Oh, be still my heart. <laughs> is that is that the uh, the young crush? Oh yeah. Kevin Bacon. Both of them, honestly. Oh, and Fred Ward. Mm hmm. Oh yeah. Ooh, who is is it getting hot in here? Or is it just me? Yeah, just grab your fan. <laughs> this is, you might you need it for the whole episode. <laughs> Uh, no, this is, this is gonna be a fun one, because this is another one of my personal favorites, and obviously it's, you know, one of yours, too. Mm-hmm. This is one of the weirder ones, though, only, and that, that's why I like it, because it's literally, you can't describe it as anything but a fun movie, because it's, it's about a group of nowhere townspeople against underground worm monsters. Oh, yeah, it's all around entertainment. There's nothing, it's hard, when you pick apart this movie, it's very difficult to find something that you don't like. At least that's the way it is for me. It's hard to not love this movie. Yeah, this is uh, what I call one of the best scripts in a horror comedy, I think. You know, they're, they're the standards, like everybody loves Shaun of the Dead, Evil Dead, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. This one should not be forgotten because it's it's one of those rare gems kind of like Another one I talked about recently in American Werewolf in London, where it just feels like a good movie, not necessarily a good comedy or a good horror film. It's just like, it's written as both. So you're not laughing out loud the whole time, and you're not like sitting on the edge of your seat the whole time, mm -hmm. which is what it should be, because levity in these kinds of films, as I've talked about before, is so important to make it believable, because a movie like this where it's not... The uh, characters are goofy, but the villain's also goofy, because that would make it stupid. Yeah. <laughs> this is a thing where the characters are fun and goofy, but the thing they're going up against is not fucking around. The Graboids are smart, they're creepy, and they're gross. Yeah, they're ugly as fuck. <laughs> yeah, giant freaking earthworms essentially. But they're so cool. I mean, how can you... When you watch this movie and you when you finally actually see what a Graboid looks like. They kind of tease it during the movie. For those who haven't seen it, it has like a ton- They have three tongues, basically, which are like- They look like snakes. Which They're they actually, mini ones, yeah. Yeah, little mini versions of it that wrap around its enemy, and then that's how they bring it in and swallow it. But when you actually see the whole thing, it's like, oh my god, these things are gross, ugly, they're huge, and they're fucking cool. Yeah, it's like- some of my favorite creature designs in cinema are the Graboids because they're so just distinct and weird. I think, as you were saying, for people who haven't seen this movie, if you want to think about what it is, imagine that episode of SpongeBob where they go into that cave with the giant worm <laughs> and it has a tongue for a worm. That's yeah. what it is, essentially. That's a Graboid. Imagine that, <laughs> but just slimy and bloody and disgusting. And the only people who can stop them are a bunch of rednecks in the middle of a 14 population town. Mm-hmm. It's small fucking town in, I think, what, what was it called? Um, Perfection. Yeah, Perfection, Nevada. Mm-hmm. What a name. I uh, I think what I want to get into first with this one, because this is there's a lot to talk about in this one, but the thing I want to first get into is the characters. And the reason why is because this is one of those horror movies where the characters are all extremely memorable. It's not fucking blonde bimbo runs into the woods and gets shanked by Masked Man. It's you like the characters in this and you're going to remember them when you're done with it. Mm -hmm. So who do you, I mean, I know you were, you know, fainting over, uh, you know, the six degree man, but <laughs> who, who, who are you particularly fond of in this that you want to start out with? You know, this is one of those special movies where I, I seriously love 
all the characters so much, even the little Chinese market guy. <laughs> Walter Walter Chang. Yeah. <laughs> but the guy who steals the show, honestly, is Bert. You have to admit. The gun-loving survivalist mm-hmm. Bert. There's a reason why, and we won't get into the fucking million sequels, but there's a reason why all the sequels were about him. God bless those sequels. <laughs> yeah, oh my god. Uh, we're, okay, we're not going to talk about the sequels, but if you want to wrap up, two is okay, three and four are god-awful, and five is decent. That's all you need to know. Yep. Michael Gross shouldn't carry a movie by himself. That's all we're saying. <laughs> but besides Bert, I really do love Earl in the first one, and in, in the first Tremors movie. Um, something about his character, you know, kind of level-headed, but still, you know, redneck and, you know, quote, old and wise. Something about that I just, I'm yeah, really that's fond the thing. of. thing. Val and Earl are obviously the, I mean, besides the graboids, the selling part of this movie. Because their friendship and back and forth, they nail this. Kevin Bacon and Fred Ward have excellent chemistry. Oh, yeah. They literally seem like they're, like, two older brothers just kind of, like, you know, messing around with each other the whole movie. Mm-hmm. And uh, what I like most of all is because there's they're they're two redneck handymen who all they want to do is get out of this town, right? Right. What I like is they're not stupid. They're not super smart, but they're not idiots either. They do some questionable things at times, but they can make good decisions. And they, they when they work together, they're able to get stuff done. I if it was just two bumbling idiots the whole time. It wouldn't be as good because they can, they get stuff done, they mess around with each other, and they they basically are the, how this town survives in the end. So yeah, they're smart enough to save their own asses and other asses. So yeah, like I, I love their dialogue alone is within the first five minutes of the movie is what grabbed me the first time I saw <laughs> it because their back and forth are just so funny, because, and it's not like laugh out loud humor, but it's it's like the way that they just seem like they've been friends for a long time. Like that when they're like, he's uh, trying to wake him up and he's like, there's a stampede. And he's like <laughs> handing on the truck and he just wakes up. And he's like, there ain't no stampede. Who's going to make breakfast. And they do, they do rock, paper, scissors to solve all their problems. Oh yeah. The each recurring other. rock, paper, scissors. That's it. Just the movie does a perfect job of showing their chemistry to showing their friendship. It's, uh, it, it's, movie is so good I, I can't stop like fangirling over it <laughs> uh, you've got you've got time to this is this is your chance this is your one chance so, <laughs> to make it to, count to make it count yeah no but but the part where um at the beginning what really hooked me into their relationship was the part where they're like trying to light the cigarettes like they just woke up trying to have a, a smoke and then kevin bacon's he's holding the lighter and then Earl's, he's hes looking all around. He's patting his pockets, checking his jacket. And he can't find the lighter. And he looks up and he sees Kevin Bacon's character, whose name is Val. He's holding the lighter. And he's just like, oh, well, fuck you. Yeah. He doesn't say that, but you can just tell in the look in his eye. <laughs> and he always, I love how he always says, pardon my French. And then he proceeds to curse still. Yeah. Yes. There's this one, I don't want to jump ahead too far, but there's this one scene that's so funny to me where they're stuck on top of the rock with Connie. And he's like, damn, son of a bitch. And he's like, pardon my French. Shit, how are we going to get out of here? It's <laughs> yeah. like he completely disregards it. <laughs> I love that part. It, it just came so naturally. Sometimes you have to wonder. It's like, was that really in the script? <laughs> well, the writers of this movie, obviously, they knew how to write dialogue. Mm-hmm. Like, that's the thing. It's like, this is a really well-written movie. It's like a B-movie monster flick, but it's written like... It reminds me a lot of uh, Ghostbusters. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say that is because, like I said, it's the normal people in an extreme situation formula where the characters are kind of funny and goofy and they play off each other. But what they're going up against can, will like, kill everybody if they don't stop it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that that reminds me a lot of the Ghostbusters formula, which is why this works. And Val and Earl, yeah, they're they're the selling points. Uh, Walter Chang's market. <laughs> he has some funny stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's just kind of the goofy market owner. He has the Pepsi mach- uh, freezer that it's broken and it goes off at the wrong time, which causes his death. That's one thing, too, is that there's so many things written in this movie that are just, you think at the beginning are just going to be like, it's just conversation, and then it comes back into play. Mm-hmm. Like when Mindy is on the, uh, she's trying to get her record for her pogo sticking. It ends up the creature tries to eat her off the pogo stick because of the vibrations later. (laughs) 
You know, when I first saw this movie, I was I was fairly young. I grew up on this movie. A, a bunch of other movies, too. Like, you know, I kind of grew up on Twilight Zone, Evil Dead. Um, thanks to, you know, the girl I grew up with. Her dad was really into those movies. And right. Yada, yada, yada. So I'd watch these movies a lot when I was younger. And that part where she's on the pogo stick and they're, you know, the, the graboids going after her. That scared me so much when I was little. <laughs> Something yeah. about that mo- that moment is so intense. Do you think it was because you were a little kid and it was going after a little kid? It might have had to do something with that, or it could have just been the fact that they played out that part so well of just how intense it was. There's a thing though, like what I like one thick thing about this movie, or something like uh, movies like The Gate, or like anything like that where children are threatened. It really kind of. It gets to you because normally 90% of the time in horror movies, it's adults that are going to get it, right? Mm-hmm. When they start messing with kids, you're like, well, wait, nobody's safe. What am I going to do now? Well, there's a part in the movie where there's two characters. There's the husband and wife and the husband's the doctor. And they're sitting and, you know, stargazing and the graboid attacks the husband and eats him. And then you're like, okay, so the wife is going to escape and tell everyone what's going to what happened and everything. But she actually gets killed in a more violent way, I think. she Her car, she goes into the car and she locks it up, but she can't start it because she doesn't have the keys. And so the right. Graboids, being as smart as they are, they end up, like, burying the car. So she fucking dies in the car with the sand and the, and the dirt coming into it. That's a much more violent death than the guy just getting swallowed. Yeah, when they when Val and Earl, because they go to find out what's going on with them, they literally find the car under the ground with the headlights still on. Mm-hmm. She was just, she was either buried alive or eaten. They don't show it, but she's dead, for sure. Even though she could have just gotten out the car and ran. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we could assume that they would have caught up to them, because... That's the big thing we should mention is that these creatures, the Graboids, they live underground, right? They're giant worms. Yeah. However, they have no eyes. The way they get you is through vibration because they use uh, the equivalent of a, I don't want to say echolocation because that's not correct, but basically they hear sounds through vibration. So whenever you walk on the ground or, you know, jump up and down on the ground, they're going to go for you like by that. Mm -hmm. So the way they eventually end about smarting these things is by using that to their advantage and distracting them. But because of that, constantly over and over again, their goal is to get off of the, the ground, which is what they have to do. And unfortunately, the doctor and the wife didn't know that. So when they go to see that their generator's been swallowed up, they just go right into the ground. Dumbasses. No. <laughs> Every if time gonna... I watch it now, I'm like, ah, don't do it. You're <laughs> going to get killed. Don't. If you want to talk about... Parts that scared you as a kid. There is one part in this movie that got me as a kid. The part where uh, old man Fred, the sheep guy, like he's the first, besides the guy in the, uh, because the first victim you see is the dude who died of uh, starvation, dehydration on top of the telephone pole. Yeah, he got scared up on the telephone pole. Right. That's where you start to be like, what the hell is going on? The dude whose sheep got killed and then he got killed. When Val lifted up that hat and his face was just there, that scared me. That, like, oh, that startled me as a kid. That still so. makes me jump when I'm not, like, expecting it. Or I'm, like, yeah. I'm sucked into the movie, seeing his face, like, just in the dirt like that. The visual effects of this movie are just fucking amazing. Oh, yeah. I. That's one thing I, I plan to spend a long time of in this episode is the, uh, the effects of this movie. Because, goddamn, it's a wet dream. For, for me, for practical effects, because there's, like, seven different types of techniques used from, like, animatronics to puppets to computer to backwards and forward scanning. It's like, oh, it's a it's a wet dream for, for an SFX guy. And what I love the most about this movie is they do an excellent job explaining what the monster is and how it works. You know, they're not like, oh, yeah, it's just a monster underground that kills people that, you know, end it like that. No, they there's a part in the movie where one of the Graboids dies. He gets knocked out because of a concrete wall underneath the ground and they start digging the body out and to examine it. And they they see the, the spikes all around its body, which they say that's how it like moves so fast underneath the ground because the spikes wiggle and kind of push it along the dirt they explain everything so thoroughly and i i think that's very excellent of them one thing i'll say is that connie is the she's a college student who is studying i guess seismology 
uh, the study of earthquakes and, you know, mm-hmm. stuff like that. She's in perfection to do that because it's a desert area. So, and she knows all about pers- that stuff because she knows about the ground and everything. So she's the one who's kind of telling them, this is how it's moved. This is how, like, you know, I'm be able to trace it or whatever. And they discover that there's three more of the things because of how she has her uh, radar thing set up. And because of that, they basically have to tell the town, hey, they're under the ground. They're not, uh, you know, they're, they're not above. They're not with us. They're below us. Mm-hmm. Which you mentioned also the fact that they explain these creatures. One thing that I like a lot is that they never say where they come from. Yeah, that's something that's kind of up in the air. It's ambiguous. And I kind of like how they never explain it because they say at one point, they're like, when they're on the rock, they say, uh, I bet they're like ancient dinosaurs we haven't discovered till now. Well, I bet they're from outer space. Like, what should we name it? And in the end, they completely forget about that. And they never say what it is. It's just a great... I think one of the theories, um, I think Earl said something about like, oh, the Russians planted it. Yeah, I think, (laughs) yeah. Because that was the time where this movie was supposed to take place. And I don't remember, I know we're talking about the first Tremors, but I don't recall them ever bringing that up in the second or the the continuations about like where I, they came from. They just sort yeah. of like appeared. No, they didn't. And you know, you know what the sad thing is too? I know obviously this movie has had five sequels, I mean four sequels, and apparently it's also getting a uh, a series, which is going to have Kevin Bacon in it apparently. Is it really? Uh, that's what I heard uh, off of an article. Is he hurting for money? No. <laughs> I actually, do you want to know a fun fact about this movie? Hmm. Kevin Bacon, like, said that when he did this movie before it came out and before it got, like, a huge success, he said that this was the lowest point of his career. Really? He was, he was on the ground screaming, I have to do a movie about worms! Like, that's what he apparently said. It's funny because I, when I think of Kevin Bacon, I, because I've seen this movie so many times, I automatically think of Tremors. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think of, like, much else. I mean, I know he's done a lot of stuff, but, like, he just so perfectly is Val. And that that's why I think of him like this. He's a southern cowboy hat wearing Kevin Bacon. <laughs> yeah, fry up your Kevin Bacon. Like, that's yeah, that's what you imagine him as. <laughs> he definitely works as the leading man in this, even though he's supposed to be the uh, slighter, dumb, redneck handyman. He, he mm-hmm. somehow ends up being, like... Every, every character pulls their weight in this movie, but he definitely pulls it a little more. Yeah. Uh, he, he Like, I, I love the scene where uh, it's a very good character moment where he and uh, Earl are arguing about who should go get the bobcat, the, uh, you know, the uh, tractor. Yeah, And yeah. Uh, they had the rock, paper, scissors like they've done four times in the movie. And you're like, okay, they're just going to do it again. And then when he goes, he just nudges him out of the way to do it because he doesn't want his friend to do it. Like, like that is a really good character moment. Like, it, it shows that he's, like... They, they'll do stupid things, but they're doing it for the right reasons. Yeah. Now, Val, Val's got a kind heart. And at the beginning of the movie, they kind of explain... Or they show his his taste of woman. They hear about <laughs> the new girl that's... You will you know, have blonde hair, blue eyes, big tits, <laughs> supple ass, and legs... Be- and like, and yeah, then, he then, says like, that. He says that exactly. Yeah, and it's like, it's not at all who he imagines. Because he has, like, his, I guess his ex's pictures all over his truck. And there's that great scene at the end where he finally, after the whole thing's over, he gets with Connie, and he just, like, right before she walks up, he just fucking crumples them all up and throws them behind him. Yeah. <laughs> he really grew up during the whole film. Yeah. And that's that's what your character should do, even in something stupid like this. Because, okay, we both love this movie, and to us it is art, right? Mm-hmm. But to, like, the Oscars or something, or the Academy, this isn't going to be, like, highbrow media, obviously. Yeah, they, they probably see this as kind of cheesy, and it, in its own way, maybe it is, but it's entertaining as fuck. Well, that's what I was saying. Like, the reason why I love this movie so much is because that's what it is. It's super fucking entertaining, and that's what movies should be. That's why stuff like, I love stuff like this. You know, I said many times, obviously, Evil Dead, uh, you know, Krampus, as mm-hmm. I've, I've also talked about. They're just fun movies. Like, they've got action, laughs, horror. They've got it's everything to keep you entertained. And, and 
the last time I saw something like that, honestly, man, I liked Kingsman, Krampus, and Deadpool. And those are the last three movies I could actually say that these were really entertaining. Out of, like, how many movies that, that have come out? It's just, like, those are just very little compared to how it was back then. Like, there were so many good movies back then and bundles. And now it just seems more... Well, I, I've said before that the 80s and 90s, I guess the 80s and early 90s, were a time where uh, they would make anything into a film. Uh, you know, Teen Wolf was a thing, remember? Mm-hmm. It's like, they would do anything, but they would have fun with them. Nowadays... Unfortunately, horror movies fall into the trope where it's like they have thrown off cliches, the paranormal activities, the, you know. The the, cheap jump scares, basically. Exactly. Every single, all the horror trailers basically look the same. It's basically some creepy version of a popular song and Mm -hmm. then some weird guy is walking around with a bunch of uh, quick edits. It's it's nothing new. Horror, this is, I'm going to sound like a, you know. Old Dave, old man Dave's bitching about his horror <laughs> movies again, but it's like horror used to be fun, and like what happened? Like, like I said, like Krampus was great, but that's like the mo- that's the closest thing I could think of. Yeah, Krampus um, was excellent. It was the humor in it. Some people didn't like that though. That I've talked to, they're like, yeah, I didn't like how like it had this weird humor, funny, haha moments in it. It's like really. Yeah, you didn't like that it was good. Some people, I guess, when they want a horror movie, they want it just straight up death blood i don't know serious i don't know michael dougherty the creator of that in trick-or-treat is probably like my favorite filmmaker right now and he just got announced that he's doing the next godzilla and i was screaming like happy because that's oh i saw something like that i didn't quite look into it though but no it's good that means it's gonna be good probably (laughs) i mean if you like him but yeah tremors I guess we should get into uh, some of the other characters. We mentioned, of course, Val and Earl. We briefly mentioned Walter. Uh, Basically, uh, the town of perfection, like we said, it's it's a 14-person population, Mm -hmm. Uh, which is, of course, ridiculous, but you you ignore it. In a way, it's it's nice, though, because there's no other, like, random characters in the background. Like, everyone has their own place, basically, in the movie. Yeah, everybody does something at some point. Like, you remember everybody. You have uh, Miguel, who is, like, the kind of Italian, you know, church-going. He's a, he's a bit, like, you know, like, oh, God, what's going on? Like, he does that a lot. <laughs> um, like you said, you've got the gun-toting uh, Vern and Heather, who Heather is played by Reba, Mac- Reba McIntyre, mm-hmm. which is, that that's an interesting uh, casting choice, but I guess it, may, it definitely makes sense for her character. Um Oh, who can forget Melvin? I was just about to say, <laughs> Melvin. Melvin, I, I the met, brat I said, child er, from hell. I said earlier that, you know, this is a movie where you like all the characters. I forgot about Melvin for a second. I mean, Melvin's pretty annoying, but in the end, you're like, oh, Melvin. He's just he a, has a his, teenage yeah. boy trying to, you know, he's basically the boy who cried wolf in the movie. Yes, exactly. Multiple times, he's like, oh, help me. You know, I'm being attacked. Oh, Grab has got me. And they rush to and help him but he's totally fine he's laughing like that's another example of a good script moment where Earl's like somebody's somebody ought to kick that boy's ass and then every single time I say alright let's go kick his ass and when they do it's the one time the creature's actually there mm-hmm. and so, when you're first watching the movie you can kind of tell they're leading up to that you're like okay this this kid you know boy you cried wolf eventually something's actually going to happen to him And but in a way you gotta enjoy that you know it's fun to see things coming sometimes oh sure they give they, they, it, it's okay to give obvious payoffs if they work mm-hmm. like uh well like, like that's an example of one like the one that surprised me like was the like i didn't think anything about this girl just pogo sticking the first time i saw it and then i was like oh that makes sense she's just she's the only one on the street she can't hear them yeah <laughs> and that thing on. yeah it pays off for her character because that's what she let. She wants to break a world record of pogo sticking. Who else we got? Oh, well, the mom of her, which is just kind of like she's kind of like the gentle motherly type. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, god damn it! Of course, the the, the gun toting couple. You know, Vern. It should be noted that they literally have a fucking bunker and arsenal of guns. Yeah, he's a survivalist. He's, like, planning for the potential World War Three happening, which, you know, in the movie, you're not quite sure if he actually believes it or not. But you, you first are introduced to him at the market. 
And he's, like, collecting all these, like, cans and stuff with his wife and talking about guns. And <laughs> yeah. like, oh, my God, who is he this has, character? He has a literal wall of everything from pistols to Uzis to shotguns. He, he has a fucking elephant gun, which he, like, breaks the glass in order to kill <laughs> one of the Graboids with. That, that killing of the Graboid has to be the most satisfying Graboid death to me because just... Him and his wife going at it, just shooting him, shooting, 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 and like, tossing fucking, like, whatever at it, and then he grabs the elephant gun and finally just, like, you see chunks of it flying and it's bleeding everywhere. You're just oh, like, yeah. oh, yeah, it's dead, the Graveloid's dead, it's just so satisfying to see it that. It really is. It's like, it's kind of, it's awesome just to see two redneck gun nuts destroy this creature. <laughs> um, by the way, there are four of the Graveloids. The first one gets destroyed by uh, when they first discover it, like you said earlier, where they sort of say, "Oh, this is how it. This is the spikes it has, or whatever." Mm-hmm. They do that because they're running away and they jump over a little concrete ridge, and it ends up going full speed into a fucking concrete bunker and it dies because it just like accidentally kills itself. It's the dumbass. It's like the dumbest one dies first. Exactly. And that's where you're like, oh, the creature's dead. Yay. And then she's like, well, hold on. There's three more. And they're like, shit. (laughs) So (laughs) from there, they have to, of course, figure out exactly how to kill each one. Mm Mm-hmm. And this movie is just obstacle to obstacle to obstacle till they finally, like, kill all the Graboids. But each obstacle they're stuck in is entertaining. It's not like... There's never a point in the movie when I'm rewatching it that I'm like, okay, I want to skip this. This part's boring. This part is just whatever. No, it's this all movie feels good. fast too. So fast, but you're like, oh, you know, it's not too fast. It's just like entertaining. You're watching every bit of it. You want to just keep watching it. Yeah, you don't you you uh you don't want to miss any moments because like it's very fast paced. There's a lot going on. Uh, there's a lot of dialogue you don't want to skip. There's a lot of back and forth quips too. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, I guess we should probably say this is that, like I, I mentioned that Val and Earl's goal at the beginning is to get out of perfection. They're basically the handymen of the town. They get paid like shit, but that's because they live in a town of 14 people. And they're doing because basically shit jobs too. Literal like shit jobs. dumpsters and shit. Yeah, literal shit when they fucking clean out a septic tank and get poured covered in it. <laughs> And that's the point where uh, they decide, we're, we're finally doing it, we're leaving. So they pack up all their shit, and they head out of town. And when they do, they discover, like, the guy who died with the sheep and the guy on the telephone pole. They go back to town and tell him, they said, okay, now we're leaving. And this time when they leave, the Graboid attacks these construction workers and blocks off the road. So, And they're, they're, I love that line where Earl says, is there some kind of goddamn divine intervention or something? Like, like they, like they would not let them leave this town at all. <laughs> the Graboids are so smart. That's what I love about them. They're, they're smart and they learn. Yeah, they're not stupid monsters. Even though, I mean, obviously one of them is when he runs into a wall, but they adapt to what's going on. Like, just because one thing killed another one, it won't kill the next one. Mm-hmm. Like, you notice that, like, because they are able, they kill. The second one with the guns, right? Right. The third one knows to hide under the ground so it the, the dirt will protect him. So they kill it with the bomb. Then the last one knows they're going to trick me with the bomb. So I'm going to not be fooled by their distracting vibrations. It adapts each time, which is mm-hmm. very, very interesting. It's not like they can use the same method four times and get out of this situation. And the last Graboid that they kill is the smartest one that at the very beginning of the film, when their Earl and Val's truck was stuck, a Graboid was holding it, but its tongue, one of the three tongues, got stuck and got pulled off. And you can tell it's that Graboid because it has, one of the tongues is like ripped off. They call it, I'm not sure if they have a name for it, but I think one point they called it Stumpy or whatever. Yeah. (laughs) But that one is like the smartest one and it's like the reoccurring one, which I liked about that. I also love the part where they pry it off the truck and Walter Chang's like, I'll give you five bucks for it. 20, 10, 15, deal. And they use it and he literally, they're taking pictures with it like it's alive to make money. (laughs) That's what I like is that they try to carry on life as normal at one point with Mm -hmm. this. They're just like, all we got to do is call for help. Uh, 
<laughs> and I love, I just love how Val and Earl always get stuck with the shit jobs, and which yeah. is funny because that's who their characters are. But even in this situation, they have to take the horses. They have to go to the next town over. <laughs> Those poor horses. That one violent death. The graboid has its like oh yeah things all the tentacle tongues all over the. It sounds like really gross it kind of is but it's like the horse is getting like strangled that was one of the more violent deaths i mean they're they're pretty good at being clean with the deaths i mean you won't see someone get torn in half or anything they just get swallowed and like disappear or you'll see remains like blood or you know their their hat and at the beginning the guy's face in the dirt that was probably like the most disturbing thing right (laughs) Or, I guess, Walter Chang's death, it wasn't like, you know, he didn't get torn apart like you said, but he gets, like, tossed around and then just, like, like swallowed whole. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, I, I like him a lot. <laughs> His death was really fucking cool. Can you imagine, like, having that big thing in there and then, like, having someone, like, an actor in there and just, like, and they move it around? That must have been so fun filming it. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, I can't... God, this is... You know what I think this is, Nikki? Why I love this movie so much? Because hmm. this is the kind of movie I would want to make. <laughs> it's just a fun monster movie with a group of people. That's that's why it's so appealing. So if you were to make a movie, you would say Tremors is one of the most biggest inspirations Influ- for you. Influential? Yeah. Yes, definitely. I, I would say that. Just like a fun, practical effects monster movie with... with characters that go back and forth and they have to solve a threatening problem like it, it's just easy but it's fun it's like mm-hmm. what's something you would want to make with your friends which that gives you like that's why i think people like stuff like this they like the cheesy stuff they like schlock is because they're like you know we can make fun of these really low lowbrow movies but then we could try and do something and it'll wind up the same way there's that's where the charm comes from they they really are timeless movies. Like this movie came out in 1990. That was two years before I was born, and I feel like this movie really is timeless. Like these characters, they don't age. Like it's just it's perfect. It's great. Here's the question though: Do you think that because it, it's kind of a a weird line with this movie because it did have mainstream success. However, it also has a really big cult fan base. Would you consider this a cult hit or an actual hit? Hmm. Because not, I'll say this. This is like I said. This movie isn't, you know, isn't like an indie film, but not everybody knows about it either. I, you know, I'm falling t- more towards cult because I feel like how I grew up watching it. You know, I was shown this movie by my friend's dad who loved this movie, so I feel like in a way, for me, it feels like a, a huge cult movie. I mean, there's a, a lot of people I know who have actually seen this movie, and I'm, you know, every time I'm like, please watch this. This movie's amazing. Right. What about you? I don't know. It's I was going to lean more towards the cult thing, too, just because it falls into that line of, like, the classic B-movie monster movie. But at the same time, it has that kind of, like... I, I would honestly put it in the same thing as, like, American Werewolf in London or, like, an Evil Dead like yeah. where it's like it's a cult hit but it's a very famous cult hit if that makes sense i know those two words contradict each other but <laughs> no i can see that I, this movie really does fall in the lines of evil dead for me like you know what okay this is a good line probably the most famous example of a movie like this like i said is a ghostbusters yeah yeah it falls into that category but it's not as famous as something like that but if you said Tremors at a horror convention, everybody would know what you're talking about. But if you just said it on the street, not everybody would know what you're <laughs> talking about. That's what I'm trying to say, I think. I love, by the way, I have to mention, I love how this movie is called Tremors. A lot of people are like, oh yeah, the monsters, the Tremor monsters. It's like, no, they're called Graboids. Tremors yeah. isn't the name of the monsters. It's just the I name of the like movie. I also like how they, they don't technically have names until they, can't, they come up with it. Mm-hmm. Because they're like... If we're going to find it, they have to have a name. It's like they, they wouldn't have had it if they weren't going to be obsessed with something stupid like that. And poor poor Walter Chang rests his his soul. He was the one who named the Graboids. <laughs> yeah, poor guy. Him and, uh, him and the piece of shit kid. <laughs> yeah, Melvin. <laughs> yeah. One thing I couldn't figure out was 
who like who's Melvin's parents? Is it is his? I mom? don't know. I wonder that the same thing. Is he just like he's like in high school? It looks like right. Yeah, he's so, obviously a teenager of some sort, whatever age, maybe fourteen. Yeah, but he doesn't have any parents at all. Like he he just he just he just hangs out. I thought there's a part where this one guy dies who's standing on top of uh, the trailer. What's his name? I think his name was Nestor. Do you remember that yeah, guy? Yeah, no, it, Lester. After he dies, there's the kid, Melvin. He's like, do something, you guys. Do something. I was like, was that his dad? But they never really like explained that's that. That's the thing. With this movie, they, at one point, say the name and establish who everybody is. So, over time. And they never said anything about that, so I don't feel like that would be it. I just, maybe, maybe he's just like an apprentice to Walter and he just lives there. <laughs> he just lives in that shack that he hides in during the movie. That would be, yeah, that would, <laughs> I mean, that's, maybe that's why he's like the town prankster because he's an only child. He's by himself and that's uh, how he gets his parents his drove to the fucking town. They dropped him off. They're like, yeah, good luck. Yeah, good luck in perfection, <laughs> asshole. motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ. He, he's like the Joffrey of this movie. He really is. He's mm-hmm. a piece of shit, but you for some reason like him a little bit. Yeah. I do like how he has that redemption at the end where they, they get, they're all riding in the, uh, the the trailer. And he's like, give me a gun. And he's like, I wouldn't give you a gun if it was World War Three. <laughs> and when they're all trying to run, he's like, all right, you know what? Here you go. And he gives them a gun and they all start running. And he goes to shoot the creature. He's like, damn, it, ain't no bullets in this thing. He's like, yeah, but I got you moving, didn't it? <laughs> It's like, God. damn, they, they really stick to it. Mm-hmm. I love the reoccurring themes in this movie. Just everything about it is just so golden. I used to watch this movie growing up with my friend Julia. We'd watch this while we were going camping. Her family would pack the motorhome, and it would take like three hours, four hours to drive over to eastern Washington. So we'd watch Tremors, and then we'd watch The Sandlot, and we'd watch The Mummy. Oh, my so God. Was, We'd, like, those would be the same movies we'd watch going camping and then coming home from camping. Like, we just watched the same movies over and over and over on VHS and the RV. <laughs> quick quick aside, because you said The Sandlot, this isn't horror, but I had a trip one time where I went skiing with some family, like, five years ago or something. Mm-hmm. And it was myself and some family friends. And we were going to bring, like, the pack of DVDs or whatever, right? Well, we forgot it, and for some reason, the only movie we had was The Sandlot. So we ended up watching The Sandlot for six nights in a row. (laughs) And so I can now say every single goddamn line of that movie because I've seen it so many times. Oh, my God. My friend Julia, she used to just... We'd watch it so often, and she would, like, taunt me. She would, like, stare at me while we'd watch the movie and just mouth every word that was being said because she knew and we were like you know 10 years old at the time not being so disturbed i was like we, we're watching this movie too much man we gotta we gotta get away from it we got we gotta get outside for christ's sake gotta get some good, air i mean i know you're really into horror stuff but sandlot on its own is just an amazing movie. i love i here's the thing i yeah i'm a horror guy but i just love the 80s in general that's my time period and yeah it's it's a cheese fest of a you know of a time period, but I love it. It, it, it. Like I said, the things they got away with in that decade mm-hmm. from the, the little childlike wonderment to the, just what the fuck is going on splatter effect movies was just, it's just amazing. I think that's why people loved like stuff like stranger things so much is because it reminded them of that decade. Yeah. Uh, what they call it? A homage, I think. Yeah, that definitely. Time. This feels like a movie. Actually, it's kind of weird. It's this movie feels like a hybrid of like it has like eighties writing, but sixties like sci fi creature. It's a good mixture of western monster and sci fi movies. Yeah, definitely. I mean, they have um, Earl. Who is who? I'm blanking here. Oh yeah, Fred, Fred Ward. Ward. Uh, he was in some western movies, so he really brings that to the table. Yeah, he he definitely seems like he fits right in with the southern gentleman kind of thing. Mm-hmm. For sure. Uh, one thing I also want to mention in this movie is that the soundtrack is pretty good too. It, like all of all of the beats are all like, uh, even though this is a uh, like a sci-fi horror action movie, it's all like saloon western stuff. But it mm-hmm. all fits really well with it. There's, I really notice the soundtrack when they're up on the roof and 
there's a point where the graboid is moving the base of the the building so that it's starting to collapse and they had this one soundtrack come on that was like it almost sounded like the theme song or something, but it was really good. And I was like, oh, yeah, this soundtrack is perfect. Like, they, yeah. everything is on point in this movie. Yeah, there's there's no... It's hard to think, like, because I always try to be at least a little bit picky when it comes to this show. But this one's hard because I, trying to find something, you know, negative about it, I, I'd have to stretch. Even it, the ending, I enjoyed you know the, the ending the is girl. yeah it, it's cheesy but it works because it, it, it ends it's just like one solid story mm-hmm. which is why i hate that this series has a million sequels because it didn't need to it's literally like town bands together and and defeats threat the end that's how it should be yeah and then you know the, you know the second installment comes up and they're like well what happens afterwards what happened to some of these characters afterwards and Oh god, I saw the third one. I haven't seen it for so long though. So the third wow, one is fuzzy. the worst in my opinion. Like the fourth one is bad too, and like I said the fifth one is slightly okay. But the third one is just garbage. Which one? Which movie has like Earl? Like it's all about Earl and I'm either like him in the past or in the future or something weird that, like that. Well, here's the thing. 3 and 4 only have a uh, uh, Michael Gross, Vern, in it, remember? I think two has... Because Kevin Bacon was only in the first one. Fred oh, Ward yeah, is yeah, in yeah, this... Yeah. yeah, I think you're talking about the second one. Yeah, no, yeah, the second one has... um. Fred Fred Ward is in it, in the second one. Has Earl in it, and then... And then the third one... Yeah, the second one, um, Kevin Bacon isn't in it, because... Um, no, because it's above his pay grade. Yeah. That's the thing, it's like... <laughs> I think Kevin Bacon, the reason why he might be doing this new show is because I think he realizes now how big of a hit it was. It's like, like I said, that cult thing. He's probably like, well, okay, if people like me as that character and I'm getting paid for it, I'll do it again. You know? Do you think he's like really swallowing his pride here and accepting it? I don't it? know. He He's set for life. It's like, you know, if I were an actor like that and I was set for life, I would do a bunch of fun movies. Mm-hmm. It's like it's like Bruce Campbell and Ash versus Evil Dead. He's he he doesn't have to do this now, but he's like the fans love me for this character, so I'm gonna play this character until I die. You know as what I mean? As the person is having fun, people can see whether or not someone's genuinely enjoying what they do. Yeah, and it's like I hate to be like you know bitching about other people's line of work, but if you're fucking acting in fun sci-fi horror comedy movies. And you're bitching about that and getting paid a bunch of money? Shut the fuck up. It's yeah, like you're seriously. you're literally being paid to go on set and have fun. It's like you have a dream job. They think it's like hard work. It's like really? Now don't get me wrong. <laughs> don't get me wrong. I I you know, with my special effects stuff, I know fake blood sucks. Silicone sucks. Makeup sucks. It it's hot and sweaty and hard to get off. But you could have a real job. Yeah, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. You could be I, sitting mindlessly in front of a computer, and uh, it's plugging very hypo- in numbers into a program, slaving. Yeah, the, you could have you a know? real job, like making podcasts on the internet. <laughs> well, your podcast is very good. Oh, thank you. I, <laughs> that's the nicest thing everyone's ever said about this. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut that one clip out and just like archive it in my uh, computer somewhere. <laughs> When you're feeling low, just remember the words. <laughs> it's a good podcast. Yeah, it's pretty okay. <laughs> and, and we're going to play it so much, you're going to be like, yeah, that fucking podcast sucks, Dave, you asshole. Don't ever go on that. <laughs> uh, Yeah, but like, no, the soundtrack's great. Uh, Gosh, I was I was trying to use that time to really think of something nitpicky, and I can't. I, uh, there's a couple, okay, if I want to get real nitpicky, there's a couple scenes where some of the effects don't completely work. Like, it's kind of obvious they had to fake it, you know. Mm-hmm. But for what they had, it's really good. Like, I let's get into that. Let's talk about all the different ways that they make these creatures come to life. Because there's, like I said, there's everything from puppets to animatronics to uh, suits to computers to, uh, like, you know, they reverse the camera. They, they oh, my, oh, the camera work! Towards the beginning, 
when the the college girl she's trying to get into her truck like she's totally oblivious to what's going on around her and you see there's a graboid going after her you don't actually see it but it's because of the camera work and it reminds me of evil dead you know the camera's towards the ground and they're kind of dragging it and it's you know aiming right towards her it looks I like a, a that sam, yeah it looks like a sam raimi shot yeah it's so good i love that stuff yeah, it uh the camera that's great. Uh I love a lot of the wide angle shots in this. Um I there's a lot of panning. It it actually the it really makes you feel like you're in the middle of nowhere just because there's a lot of shots of the desert. Like it kind of zooms in on a lot of like outward shots of just how small this town is. Mm-hmm. Like when they're on the roof, you can literally see the beginning and the end of the town. And that really makes you feel like, oh my god, these people really are alone. So it definitely contributes to that. Apparently, when they were... So they built the town like it was a set. And after it was all done, they tore it down. (laughs) Oh, really? Isn't that amazing? Like, all that work to build the town, they just... They tore it all up. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's not as much work as, like, some, like, studio lot sets or something, but... Yeah, that's crazy. They just went into the fucking desert and they just built this random little town. There's one shot in the movie, I forget where, I think it's towards the end, but like you see the background, You they really are in the middle of fucking nowhere. Yeah. I it, love it, how they, they just capture you, you're like alone in the desert, you're all by yourself, you're in the yeah. western. And it's like movie. none of these, I also like how nobody, with I guess with the exception of uh, Vern, nobody is like a badass in this movie. Like, nobody's, like, super awesome hero gonna save the day. They're all, like, a combination. It's two handymen, a college girl, uh, an asshole kid, uh, a mother and her daughter, an mm-hmm. Italian, a uh, a supermarket-owning Asian, and a gun nut and Reba McIntyre. It's like, and that's what you have to go against these worm creatures. That are, I like, like destroying that. destroying things. Like, not only, like killing people but like destroying things like destroying cars and preventing people from escaping yeah it's like and i like how even like the gun nut he makes dumb decisions like he won't go on the roof even though they tell him to yeah he's so stubborn nobody's flawless in this movie that's what i like about it everybody feels human and that's that's a key to something like this where it's Mm -hmm. not you know meant to be taken seriously oh yeah uh i guess um anything what else did you want to say about this one Oh, man. It's just a good fucking movie. I mean, we really covered the majority of it. I mean, it's good visuals, good characters. The set was amazing. Well, I, you know what? Here's a good thing we could say. Why do you, you, you mentioned that when you your friend, some of your friends saw Krampus, they were complaining about how, you know, oh, they had this weird, like, comedy to it. Mm-hmm. Why do you think people don't like something like that like for something like this because this this movie won't appeal to everyone because it's not a straightforward haha laugh out loud r-rated comedy and it's also not a spook fest so why do you think people don't like that blend of genre everyone just has their acquired tastes basically a lot of people like comedy into putting that into a a horror genre because maybe to them they can relate well if you're dealing with something so terrible you try to find humor in it you know that's what i would do to make it more real maybe that's why it seems more real to me than you know just watching a horror movie and just being scared and jumping at everything and then that's it right no exactly it's like i i have some friends who are military and they say that the best thing you can do is they, they have a really dark sense of humor. They have to make each other laugh because you're literally going into war. It's life or death. So all you can do is laugh at it. Mm-hmm. It's like the same thing here. It's like if they're going to go against this supernatural threat, something that obviously can't occur in nature. Yeah, of course they're going to, you know, make light of it. It's, it's all you could do to keep it like people because people will nitpick if they played this straight, you know? Yeah. Like, that would never happen. There's no worms under the ground like that. They would complain, but if they make it up for yucks, then it works because they're like, oh, well, they're not taking it seriously. I really do find realness and humor with such awful situations, you know? Oh, sure. 
like I don't know how you think about it, but there are not a lot of straightforward comedies I like. Like I, I especially nowadays, like what I call the red band era of comedies. I, I have I can't remember the last one I actually enjoyed. The red band. Yeah. Do you know what I mean by that? Mm. -mm. Every where every single comedy is. This movie is too wild for you, and it has the red band trailer that's like. Whoa, it's two wacky guys on an adventure where they go to a party and smoke weed while a p popular song plays during the trailer. Like, okay. that's every fucking yeah. R-rated comedy right now. And none of them make me laugh. Like, I cannot remember the last time I saw one that I actually was like, ha, ah, that's a good joke that you wrote. You know? I can't think of a movie that I enjoyed that was like that either. Not at all. The like last the la movie I, I think I, I enjoyed because it was actually so stupid that I enjoyed it was a uh, hot rod I'm not sure if you've seen that wow movie. I have and that's a long time ago <laughs> holy crap I, <laughs> I, I actually like hot rod because I like Andy Samberg yeah I thought that movie was I laughed pretty hard if I had to think of like parts. like the last straightforward comedy I actually liked it was probably like 22 jump street and I didn't see that one and that one because it was literally making fun of sequels <laughs> but like I love blend of genres more like this. This is like my ca favorite kind of movie. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, like just something about, and like, like you said, everybody has their own tastes, you know? Uh, I just can't find any enjoyment in where I go to watch a movie where a bunch of people fucking smoke weed and have <laughs> sex and they call it a comedy. You know what I mean? Yeah. What was that one movie? Uh, hot tub time machine. Yeah, Exactly. <laughs> Like That's if you want, example. if you want that, go to a fucking fraternity party. You know, mm -hmm. don't you don't need to make a movie out of that. But it really that, is acquired tastes. I mean, there are, I do have friends who do like just the straight horror uh, movies. No, no comedy, no nothing in between. No, no romance even. Just straight sure. up horror. And I, I like I like some of those too. Like I I love all different kinds of stuff. Like Babadook, Conjuring. You know, all different kinds of, like, I, I, I'm a horror guy, obviously, but, like, I also have a big appreciation for when it doesn't take itself seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I, I, like I said, I try to have an appreciation for all different kinds of horror, from kids' movies to fucking gore films, so. I feel like if Tremors were a movie that was just straight horror, it would have been really bad. It would have been enjoyable to watch at all. I guess... Like, like if it was just, like, really just, like, scares the whole time and no, like, real character interaction. Mm-hmm. If it was just, like, oh, this monster's underground killing people and that's it. There's no, like, scientific explanation. There's no, you know, it. the fact that the characters are so good, so well-rounded, there is comedy, there's realness, there's romance in it, and there's these awful monsters that the, these small town people have to fight against. That's what makes it just such a good movie yeah it's just all around entertaining it, it, it's it's one that everybody should check out this is one that if you watch it you're just gonna have a fun time yeah hopefully you guys have watched it who are listening <laughs> yeah well spoilers that's, pe no no people know by now if you're listening to this show it's not my fault if i spoil something for you yeah, it's like my damn fault I actually had somebody complain one time that I did an episode on Alien, and it's like, I haven't seen that. It's a movie from the 80s. That's not my fault. Like, Jesus. It's like, you haven't seen something. You probably shouldn't listen or watch something that's related to it that's explaining it. I've or... given up I've given up saying spoiler alert because so many people <laughs> have. I mean, because, I mean, like, that's just common sense for this show. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> but, uh, no. Check out Tremors if you haven't seen it yet. Uh... Like I said, second one's okay. Sequels are garbage. I have no idea what they're going to do with this series. Apparently, Kevin Bacon's going to be involved again. Yeah, I'm Maybe, interested to see that, actually. If it, I wonder if it's going to be like Ash vs. Evil Dead, where Fred Ward and Kevin Bacon are old Val and Earl, and, like, you know, they're coming back to the town, and it happens again. Man, isn't, like, Fred Ward, like, he's fucking in his 70s now? He has to be. Yeah, I think he's like late 60s, 70s. He's an old man. He's got Fred warts all over his face. That was a bad no! Joke. <laughs> that was bad. Um, <laughs> Boo! Well, no. you remember, yeah, yeah, Dave, remember what you, I said about your podcast? I take it all back, you hack. <laughs> yeah, this is like a, a 2 out of 10 podcast. I'm out. <laughs> Bye. Bye.
podcast <laughs> over. No, but uh, I I think that really much that pretty much sums it up. Tremors, it's great. Yeah, it was. It's it's good. I hope you guys watch it again after listening to this. So, um, thank you, Dave, for having me on here. By the way, thanks um, for coming on. I really on. appreciate you reaching out and stuff, and I. It's an honor to be here. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, if if people don't already know you, where can they find your stuff? Uh, check me out on Twitter, uh, Nikki Knacks, or check out my website, NikkiKnack.com. And I post art and comics. And yeah, that's where you can find me. And uh, Nikki, as I always say, how are we going to end this episode? Well, pardon my French, but let's end this son of a bitch podcast. Shit! Oh! <laughs> Fuck! <laughs> <laughs>